Bonjour et bienvenue à l'épisode 65 du podcast Innovation, Agilité et Excellence. Mon nom est Jean-François Nantel et en compagnie d'Éric Lereux, nous désirons vous offrir réflexions, conseils et perspectives afin de faire face aux perturbations du marché et de développer la croissance profitable de votre organisation. Dans notre épisode d'aujourd'hui, je discute climat des affaires aux États-Unis avec le professeur Stephen Blank que nous avons déjà vu sur notre podcast à l'épisode 25. Après une période compliquée relative à la pandémie de SARS-CoV-2, nous voici aux prises avec des perturbations économiques et géopolitiques importantes. L'inflation atteint dans la plupart des pays du G20 des niveaux jamais vus depuis le début des années 80 et le continent européen subit un conflit militaire de haute intensité pas vu depuis les années 90. Je me tourne donc vers mon expert de prédilection dans ces cas et pose des questions difficiles sans fioritures. Vu la conjoncture actuelle et vu les perturbations politiques ayant cours aux États-Unis, est-ce toujours aussi intéressant d'y faire des affaires? Tentons de trouver des réponses avec lui. Stephen Blank vit et travaille à New York. Il détient un baccalauréat de l'Université Dartmouth, des maîtrises des universités de Cambridge et de Harvard, ainsi qu'un PhD de Harvard. Sa longue carrière couvre les milieux universitaires, d'affaires et des organismes sans but lucratif. Pendant de nombreuses années, son travail a porté sur les relations entre le secteur public et le secteur privé, et ce tant au niveau national qu'international. Il est connu pour ses travaux sur l'intégration nord-américaine en ce qui concerne les régionalismes, les corridors commerciaux, les systèmes de production et de distribution transfrontaliers et les infrastructures. Il est auteur ou co-auteur de nombreux livres et articles et a été décoré de l'Ordre national du Québec. M. Blank a rencontré des difficultés à se connecter lors de la séance d'enregistrement et celle-ci ne s'est pas déroulée dans un environnement optimal. Je trouve cependant que le contenu de notre échange mérite d'être partagé malgré le fait que nous perdons quelques mots ici et là, environ une seconde après que je dise quelque chose. Merci de nous en excuser à l'avance. To hear you on the U.S. economy and how the U.S. market has evolved in the past 20 years. How it has evolved in the past 20 years or looking forward? Looking forward uh, as well, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, just let me, because it, it, let me say a couple words here to begin with. I've spent a lot of my life working with clients doing forecasting based on scenario building. That was our, our yes. achievement with multinational strategies. What we told clients was this. If the most likely scenario and the next most likely scenario are very similar, Yes. That means the way to be clear. Uh, if it's five degrees or six degrees, uh, 4,000 or 5,000, that's not bad. But if the most likely scenario and the next most likely are 180 degrees apart, yes, you got big. And looking ahead in the United States today, uh, doing any kind of forecasting is big problems mm -hmm. because the, the most likely scenarios are all 360 degrees uh, to Dasmuth. All the way around the, I mean, we could easily have in a few months, uh, a based on the inter, the, uh, the uh, elections coming up in the in the fall, um, a, a sporadic violence taking place, mm -hmm. leading in election in, in 2024, which would be like none other than we've ever had. Yes. Uh, with, I mean, or or we could have a beginning of a new. Uh, uh, calm period, calm politically, with people getting a hold of themselves, and way ahead on uh, on uh, uh, economic development. So it's really very hard. Forecasting is is a is a is a mugs game at mm -hmm. this point. You know, we don't mind doing it, and I said I'm getting paid so much for this. I'm delighted to take it take a try. But this, okay, and what do we know in the past past 20 years? A couple of things. One is that the speed of technological change, yes, fundamental technological change, is probably greater than in, in, at any time in, in history, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can talk about the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, the huge changes that change people's lives, that change our structures. But we are now changing the structure of the Earth, exploring the structure of the universe, dealing with, with genetics, with changes to our health both good and bad, 
good mm-hmm. in the sense that we're learning new things, but bad in the sense of globalization leading us into new diseases. Uh, again, incredible uh, change, which is shaking everybody and terrifying everybody. The second thing is that in this period, we've seen a, an amazing gap between wealthier and poor. I mean, yes. what has happened is really interesting. If you look at the big money in the world, for the most part, outside the oligarchs, and people mm-hmm. like that, look at the yes. United States. Billionaires, this is new money. This is not old money. Mm-hmm. This is new money, and it's money based upon the ability of a number of young people, Jeff Bezos and others, to see to, to, to expand, you know, to see a niche and build in it. A yes. couple of years ago, Jeff was blogging old books, used books. And it, there's no doubt that in this period of intense technological change, which is going on all around us, there are lots of places, niches, for people to build like Bezos did, things you wouldn't expect. Mm -hmm. And the likelihood is that we're going to see, uh, this is not like the the depression or traditional recession. There's lots of money, Mm -hmm. lots of money floating around. And and, And there's big money for investment. In the United States, we have 750 billionaires. I mean, how can you have, I mean, not millionaires, billionaires. Billionaires. That's a lot. And there's investment capital floating around. And it is, and, and a lot of it's in private hands. Yes. The ability, I mean, that that's enormous. And at the same time, the gap between richer and poor has gotten wider and wider. Yes. One of the reasons it, it, it has, in a way, is that the middle class in this country has shrunk. Yes. Particularly the white middle class, as a mm-hmm. matter of fact, white and mm-hmm. black. With more people doing well and more people doing poorly, mm-hmm. leaving a wide and less of a robust middle class. Yes. And, you know, the, all sorts of things flow from that. The lack of mobility. In traditionally the United States, people have moved to jobs. Yes. And now it's almost impossible. On one hand, in the growing years, property is too expensive to buy. Yes. And in poor areas, property is so inexpensive, everyone's underwater. They can't get out. Mm-hmm. So this this the lack of mobility is... is very challenging. And it's new to the U.S. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. You could always, I mean, that was the point, uh, you know, you go to the frontier, but even with industrialization, people move. Think of the the great movement of of black people north in Mm -hmm. in the uh, first half of the century. Yes, 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 this was a great movement. Now, particularly as you go to the poorer and poorer areas and the heavier working class areas, the mobility is less and less. Mm. You know that's that's a big problem. So this gap between richer and poor is is substantial, huge, and growing. Yes, it's and again, this is not old money. This is not old, you know, Wall Street. This is new money, mm-hmm. uh, in mainly in the technology, uh, and so th- that has been a tremendous change. And and I and uh, there's n- no reason to think that's not going to change in, as we move in the future. Mm-hmm. It, we may muddle into a recession. But it will be an odd recession because it'll be a recession for the people who are poorer, who are recessed. Yes. It'll be not a recession for the people who are doing well. Yes. And we've seen a lot of that in France. The 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 and 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 you, I think you've just put this into words as to something I've been seeing, but been unable to to uh, to, to phrase. Uh, but uh, when I was in the in the Midwest in the uh, late 1990s, um, I was stunned by the fact that approximately 20 percent of the population of the United States moved every year to to new jobs, to better conditions. To but uh, as you say, uh, prime real estate in in in. Uh, in cities where jobs are plentiful and well-paying, uh, is it's becoming impossible for someone from the Midwest, for example, to move to Los Angeles, San Francisco. Uh, I don't know about Atlanta, well, but certainly New York. is, well, is It's impossible well, anymore. Someone from Ohio, working class Ohio, West Virginia. Yes. Uh, where you have Rust Belt types mm-hmm. who ought to be lured away by higher salaries, which are, which are available, but they can't get out. Mm-hmm. Because of their their own situations underwater, and they can't move to a place they could possibly afford. Yes, and, and I mean there's issues, housing issues, but that that dimension likely to continue. So on one hand, as we move forward in the next 20 years, 
we're likely to see an increasing pace of technological change, change right down to our very fundamentals of our health, yes. of our longevity, of, of the climate, everything. At the same time, the gap between those who are participating in it and those who are not is greater. When I went to high school, when I went to college, the assumption, for example, high school, I went to a rural some high school, uh, and the assumption was that when you, people didn't go to college from my high school. When you got out, you got a job. Mm -hmm. You got a job, you got kids, and th yeah, that was it. You All that you needed to know, you learned in high school. Uh, you didn't need to know much of anything in terms of maturity. You learned how to do stuff. We had metal shop, we had wood shop, we had body shop, we had all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. People were fairly skilled, and they expected to work. And by and large, in my class, they worked for their 25 or 30 years. Many of them were in unionized positions. They had their health care when they retired. They had their pension. Uh, I mean, they sent their kids to go. They, these people were the true beneficiaries of, of the change in, in, in our, you know, the managed economy, the welfare state in the early, uh, after the years after the war. Um, when I went to college, uh, my, at Dartmouth, you know, fancy college, they thought we didn't know, need to know, learn anything. We were taught to be gentlemen. Assumed we would have a job. Yes. Most people who went, if they weren't professionals, and many of them were professionals, lawyers and doctors, but you went to work for a company, you'd be there all your life. You expected that if you went to IBM. Some, and every couple of years, you'd review where you wanted to be. I remember when I worked for IBM as a consultant, every couple of years, everyone through the company would be sit down with an HR person. Where do you think you're going to be in five years? Where would you like to be in five years within the company? Mm -hmm. You didn't think I, I mean, now, if, if I were giving a, a, a commencement address this year, I would say, this is not the end of anything. This is not the end of learning. This is just one, because you have to spend your whole life learning. If you've learned anything in the last four years, it better have been how to learn. How to learn. Learned how to learn. You're going to live in a world that's completely different than what you have now. And from the technology at your fingers to what you do for a living, to how you live, all you, and you're going to have to learn how to do that. And so this is no longer, we can say, this is the beginning of a new era. This is not the beginning of a new era for you. You're going to have to keep, and those of you who know how to do it, who become adept at it, will succeed. We, yes. Particularly if you have daddy, daddy's contacts and the school's help and so on. And those of, of you who can't figure it out, are, 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 you know, you're, you're, you're going to go lower and lower. And so I think this whole, this whole uh, uh, world is, is going to change a lot, and it's very hard for me to see how the the social, the economic, the social, and the political consequences of this mm -hmm. are avoidable. Mm -hmm. I think we're very rough times. Yes, I think in this country in particular, as opposed to Canada or France, the times are going to be rougher mm -hmm. because extreme localization of our political system, the inability of the federal government to do very much to deal with the major issues that confront us, and the deep cleavages that exist uh, for a whole bunch of reasons in, in our society. And I don't see any way, and, and then on top of that, we are a desperately fully armed society. There are 20 million assault weapons yes. out in the United States. Do you know how many that is? That means you have one assault weapon to every person who served in any realm of the military in World War II, anyone, you give them, everyone gets an assault weapon, you have four million left over. Oh. We have more handguns than we have people. I mean, what you're, and, and, and people who are really angry and prepared to use these things, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know how you can, we can avoid this kind of tension. The question is, what paths there are to resolve it without this falling apart into chaos. And I think one of the scenarios that's on the table for the United States is an increasing level of chaos. And mm -hmm. it's interesting. Uh, last night, there was a shooting in Philadelphia. This morning, there was a shooting in, uh, in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And now we've learned, if we hear on the radio or TV, that 17 people were dead. We know it was an assault rifle. But if we learn that there were Three. 50 people injured, then we know these, this was a, a gang of kids with pistols. Yes. I mean, why do we learn this? It's just dreadful. So I, I don't see how we can avoid uh, this localized mayhem uh, 
um, uh, emerging up. And again, a lot will depend if the Republicans take over Congress in November, which is an, alas not unlikely. Mm-hmm. If you know, if God forbid, Trump should win in 2024, which and and if in fact, imagine the election in the United States of 2024, where four, five, six, seven states overturn the popular vote. And say no, no, no. We don't want the popular vote. We're going to. I mean, how do you resolve that? Um, I, I I don't know. No. Now, and now, the other scenario on the table is the wealth, the industriousness uh, of the country. Yes. Because uh, our econ- the economic situation, as opposed to the financial situation, inflation, we really are pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and. And not to mention, we could we are involved in a shooting war with Russia, which is a. <laughs> well, let, let, let's not go there. This 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 uh, we we could we'll we'll save that one for another podcast. Uh, back to economics. NAFTA has been replaced by USMCA, um, uh, the U.S. Mexico Canada Agreement. Much ado about nothing, or has this new agreement had some real uh, or perceived impact on trade imbalance or perceived trade imbalance? Much ado about nothing. Uh. If you look at the at the agreements itself, it, 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 there isn't anything that wouldn't have been done anyway. You didn't have to call it all of this. You didn't know, n- need all the storm and drong. Mm-hmm. And this, the problem was, of course, on top of that is Trump's own policies about tariffs. Mm-hmm. Which have nothing to do with with the new after MC, nothing that. And um, what is really interesting in all of this is even since nine eleven. Remember, in nine eleven, we talked about the hardening of the borders. Yes. What is really uh, uh, Jean Francois is how well the system has worked. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the, the the system works extremely well. We are. Now, if you think of Mexico, north of Mexico City, because south of Mexico City, there's that's problems. another story. Yes, story. If you look at by and large, uh, we we are a single productive unit. Now, there have been places left out. I mean, again, Mexico south of Mexico City, uh, the Atlantic provinces, northern New England, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. lots of out because that you know others have grown. The big danger is what I said last time is that is Canada keeping up? Yes. If you look at automotive, it, it, it's you know this this is not Ford GM. This is this is it's right. these are new companies, mm-hmm. new suppliers. Yes. Uh, new technologies. Of, Everything it, is new. Yes, and, and uh, Google uh, is going to be a big player in the automotive world because of the screens. Increasingly, mm-hmm. the Google screen is going to be the car built around it. The car is now a computer on wheels mm-hmm. with big. The question in my mind is it, not borders. It's is Canada keeping up with this? Now we know that Canadians are doing extremely well, but they come to the United States. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of Canadians in these businesses, but they're not working from Canada. Mm-hmm. And no, can, no that, big Canadian businesses have in, have invested in in, in R and D and to to move the the automotive industry in Canada to this new technology. You have a lot of small companies in Canada really at the forefront of different technologies. But in tr- as, as always, they're not big enough mm-hmm. and, and they have not yet caught the eye of the new players yes. because the new players are not to, you know, the, the whole of Detroit Windsor was where the cars developed as a binational industry, mm-hmm. Tele- telecommunication, binational industry. We did it together. Yes. Now the new players are, are, are not, not, don't have that background. And besides, there's lots of Canadians anyway. They come down, and they work. So I, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, Mexico has done well because of geography, climate, a, a lot of uh, vegetables, and so on. There, and th- they've done very well on automobiles uh, with new technology because they started from stress, from from from, from zero. nothing. Yes. Yeah, but the, the most important point is that this is a single economic unit more and more that people take for granted that don't really understand it has all sorts of difficulties in it not least of which is one bridge the 80 percent of all the automotive stuff goes over back and forth which is owned by an old family i mean and it's it's it's, uh, there's crazy things but i think and this is one of my great uh, uh annoyances with the people who look at this uh that no one wants to write about the successes Mm -hmm. 
no one write about the fact that after 9-11, the border hardened. The automotive industry took a deep breath, worked through various workarounds, and, and, and survived and thrived. Yes. Uh, the big now is not those things, the old issues, although tariffs are a pain in the ass. Uh, it is the new technology. It is building together the new technologies. That means old centers you know, get left by the way, mm-hmm. new ones arise. Mm-hmm. So we don't. But if you're thinking in general, in general, we are still more than ever because we're, we're used to it. Mm-hmm. We work together. If you look at agriculture, if you look at automotive, if you look at uh, almost well, anything, we are. There are only a few exceptions. Uh, uh, wood, for example, is still a contentious issue between both countries uh, and, and automobiles with Mexico as well. But uh, And I think, as, as I agree, I think uh, as technology evolves, all these cards are going to be uh, replayed. Um, going back to this mobility question you raised earlier on, um, I remember when you taught this class doing business in the United States or doing business in North America, you mentioned that the U.S. is not one big market, but there were five or six regional markets. Has this changed or how has this evolved? Or are you going to see this as five or six cities and and the rest? Or how how what's your take on this one? Okay, a couple of different things here. Um, let's talk about your turn it around, friend of mine. Fundamentally, like Canada, um, in the United States, we are a federal system. Mm-hmm. Uh, federal government in the United States, in some ways, has less power than the federal government in Canada, although Canadians don't really understand it. Yes. The reason it does is there are only a couple of provinces. And the prime minister can pick up his telephone and call, talk to the premiers all at once. Yes. We get them around to You have 50 states. You can't do that. No. And the, the far more varied in policies. So in a way, uh, the federal government in Canada has been able to do more things, to act like a national government than the U.S. has been able to. Mm-hmm. For in those countries, the demographics have me- seen the rise of great metropolis, metro areas. Yes. Some of them cross borders, you know, in, in, in lower, in low, lower Ontario and Canada, the, the Rust Belt area in the far west and so on. But it means that mayors do not have nearly enough power. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I spent a lot of my life in Canada. I talked to many mayors. I talked to many uh, uh, provincial premiers. Yes. The mayors were always pissed off. They have all the costs and none of the money. And the, 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 the premiers have all, all the money, but none of the, none of the costs. I mean, that's, it doesn't. Exactly. And, and none the, of the problems. That's, and, yes. that's a huge issue uh, for the future because we're definitely moving into a, Uh, a metro, a metropolitanizing era, and in both countries we see a significant uh, uh, loss of populations in some areas yes. and the growth. Now these are not downtown metro areas; they're they're larger metro mm-hmm. areas. We have to think about. Mm-hmm. But how, uh, if you look at think of a North American map going out a few more years to, to 2050 of where population is, where innovation is, you're really looking at clusters rather than states or provinces. Agreed. So that's the second. Uh, your big question. I think we're going to see. We're seeing very much a nationalization of the market in both countries and in in the whole of the whole of North America. Mm-hmm. Uh, because TV, internet, whatever. I mean, I have no idea where. Well, I, I mean, I don't even care where Jeff Bezos has put Amazon. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't know. I just go online and I I buy something. Yes, and it's sent to me. I yes. I nor do I really brands are are not. So at one level, we have an increasing nationalization. And yet, because, again, of technology, uh, we have a localization at the same time. Mm-hmm. So you have dialectic between local local products, local stores, local markets, and and And, and, and national- global platforms. And, yes. And mm-hmm. for many companies doing business in North America, you have to make a decision. Uh, if you go in locally and do well, You, you really want at some point to become more, do, will you at one point want to become more national or continental and how do you do it? Or do you want to go in at a more continental level and maybe mm. miss the opportunity of developing regional bases? And, you know, that's the, and that when you pay your money and you get your, take your choice. I don't think there's any map. It really but, depends but, on how people see their product, yes. how they, you know, conceptualize their firm. 
And the other thing, I think I've said this in my class a million times. Yes. You're going to do business in the United States, get a good lawyer. The first <laughs> yes. thing you need is... Yes. And this I, 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 when, I, when I teach now, I say, you want to do business in the United States, first thing you do is get a good lawyer. You want to do business in France, the first thing you do is get a good accountant. Uh, yeah <laughs> and, and it takes me to another case i want to submit just we're trying this out uh, i'm um i'm putting you the in the situation of being the ceo of a french company called decathlon a privately owned french manufacturer uh, and retailer of sporting goods and sportswear with seven seventeen hundred stores in 60 countries a turnover of about 14 billion euros uh yearly Uh, and I'm trying to get into the United States, and I'm trying to get into Canada. And and the CEO of Decathlon is finding success in Canada. With he's got nine stores and looking to open two or three more in Western Canada. He's he's done well in in Quebec and Ontario, but in the United States, he's opened a few stores on the West Coast and he's closed them and he's moved to a fully online um, uh, penetration strategy. How can we explain the differences between his Canadian adventure going according to his plan and his U.S. plan going basically back to the drawing board? Well, I think here, I would say, without knowing all the details, of course. Jakun Asongu, that is everyone, that you'll decide based on your, your you have to look at your company uh-huh. and yes. decide, great, what are our weaknesses? Um Obviously, there have been sporting goods companies that have moved uh, online first mm-hmm. to develop the brand. Yes. And then they have local, there have been the companies that have been localized and then when able to use that local base to expand. To expand. I don't have a book. I don't think there's a guidebook for that. It is very much, you know, when I taught this kind of stuff, yes. uh, I was always an outsider with strategy mm-hmm. because I... I never believed in it very much, having worked for companies for so long. And I said, the first thing you have to do, there are there are brave companies and there's and there are scared companies. Yes. There are rich companies, poor companies. There yes. are smart companies. That, uh, they may sell the same product, yes. but they're, they're self, uh, some are aggressive and, and some hold back. And all the people in the companies really, you, you know, they, they attack, uh, like attracts. And you develop that kind of personality. The companies have a personality. Uh, one of the big issues now that we didn't, because before the regu- deregulation of financial markets, finance was not such a big issue. You had it or you didn't. Now you have to realize, you have to ask, how good are you with, with finance? How good are your, your people? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Access to money. Uh, do I, how much can I uh, extend out financially before I get in trouble? Uh, do I have to build a brick and mortar place to get enough money coming mm-hmm. in before Mm -hmm. build a a wider platform those things you have to look inside the company they're not out there they are in the company's personality in its goals in its view of itself yes and i think mistakes we make in teaching strategy is to be looking outward rather than looking you know too much rather than looking inward how do we operate how are what are our our personal strengths what are what is our style and i I, think so I don't think there's a rule book. I think very much the company has to make a, a decision. But again, based on access to money, uh, uh, based on its quality of its online performance. Yes. If it has a poor performance, or it's you know, or it's digital maturity. Yes. 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 So that would be my answer. There, look inward first and develop a really good profile of your company. What are you good at? What are you not good at? What do you need? And then develop your strategy more on those bases because i think you could do it one way or the other and there are very mm-hmm. good examples of both back back when 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 i was your student uh 25 years ago uh i remember learning that uh globalization was essentially a, an american success because north Amer- or north american or american companies had had this time to go national and by the time they went national they had such a, a, a size premium over their european canadians or asian counterparts that it was easier for them to 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 go global quote unquote and nowadays it actually seems that speed and and as you say culture is the premium that the markets will favor uh, 
Uh, so well, this ability to go quickly. Well, let me correct this. Uh, I th you're right up to a point. But one of the problems with U.S. firms globalizing, and we learned that more mm -hmm. in, in the 60s, 70s, was that they had a very high hurdle rate going abroad because there was always a part of North America or the United States they had not been to. Yes. So then you went to the, the CEO and said, I, let's open up an office in Nigeria or wherever. Or you say, okay, but you have to make more money there than we could have made with the same investment in going Florida. to Albuquerque. Yeah, in exactly. <laughs> where I worked for French, German, French companies, say in Nigeria, they said, we have to be here. Mm -hmm. We have to be, going to be the most important market in Africa in 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Yes. The Americans said, we don't have to be there because <laughs> unless we can make more money. More money. Now, then we're making in another part of the United States. We could introduce another product line in, in, in Seattle for the, pro and so Many of the firms that I worked with, and except in raw materials, where it's not an issue. Of course. Well, that's, yes. General Electric I worked with in Nigeria, they were willing to put almost no investment. They sent this young fellow out to see if he could drum up some business, mm -hmm. whereas Siemens laid a foundation, a huge foundation, uh, to be in Nigeria forever. Mm -hmm. But so, so we were, Americans were very good at easy, we were very good in Europe, but we were very lousy in, in Brazil very lousy in much of Africa, lousy in India, uh, not very good in, in China until the Chinese wanted us, because these were hard countries. Yes. And you said, well, back home, with 90% of your business is in the United States or North America, and we were never good in Indonesia, for example. We're never very good in Indonesia, because you have to be there for a long time. It's a hard country. It's a huge investment, big risk. Uh, let's go to, uh, with, we haven't been in Wisconsin. Let's go to Wisconsin. We <laughs> Most, and, yeah. and 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 so there's there's this question of cultural um, affiliation or yeah. or or families uh, that make make things simpler. Yes. Yeah. Going back to the, the 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 case study, you ask yourself: Have we gone abroad before? Have we experience? Mm -hmm. Maybe we should buy in the United States yes. in our area yes. and see how it goes. Yes. And one of the things we tried to convince various companies to do um, was buy something yes uh, and see how, how it goes how do you you know buy no into one, the culture every, everyone is surprised by the litigiousness of 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 us i mean there was this wonderful funeral company in in vancouver really <laughs> i mean and they bought funeral homes all and especially they found they could pick them up in the south you know the, the african-american run funeral homes they could buy them for nickels and dimes and they got in one and there was a lawsuit and they said, oh, there's no problem here. Not realize <laughs> in the United States, you can often pick your venue. Yes. And if you may recall this, they, they went out of business. The, the, the jury, which you know don't happen in many countries, awarded so much money to this, this funeral in the United States who felt he had been wronged that it drove them right out of business. I mean, mm -hmm. and it never occurred to them that that could possibly happen. So again, what is your experience? Good experience and bad experience. What is your, the length of time that you're willing to risk on this? You know, how high is your hurdle rate? Uh, how much money you're willing to put into it? So again, buying something may be a lot easier, a way of entry, yes. than, than uh, building something yourself. Building so something. lots of ways a lot of it depends on your own, and and it's 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 typical of the of the culture of the uh, the ownership of the Cathlon, who have a tendency to do everything homegrown. And uh, when I, I I researched a little bit the case before asking you the question, the the Mullier family is is something uh, somewhat of a close circle, and it's still privately owned. And there's no public capital, and uh, so buying into something else seems like bringing someone foreign into the family might be strategically difficult decision to make. Um, another question for you. Quebec is seeing uh, the employee shortage affect many industries. France is finally getting its hands around the problem, although over here it still seems to impact only a few very visible sectors. Where do you see the great resignation that Paul Krugman called going f in the near term and midterm, especially given what you've talked about earlier? I think we'll look back on this and think it and found it never happened. <laughs> I, I think that there are a certain uh, level of people, but most people can't afford to do that. 
they have to go back to work. I mean, I, I, I think, again, the biggest problem about attracting workers is mobility and skill. It's very hard not to find a job where some level of digital skill is, is not necessary. I mean, we look at car, my, my uncle never learned to read and write. He was one of the best car dealers mm-hmm. in northern, northwestern Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And automotive mechanic, he was the best in what he just listened. Now, it, 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 nothing is like that. No. It's it, your digital skills, your computers you have to are, are more almost everything. So, I mean, there are very few jobs that are worthwhile at all that don't require high levels of skill. And then moving beyond that, physically moving is, is difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, I don't know how that adjustment process will work. Uh, I think, again, not being that we have twice as many jobs at the moment open as we have unemployed people. Mm-hmm. If you count the left the workforce, it, it balances a little bit more evenly. But most of those jobs are in hospitality and so on. Uh, even though people are paying better, there's a reluctance to go. Uh, but... The, the jobs, if you're at Amazon, the jobs you know, elsewhere, they're halfway good, available to people. It, it, it requires skills and mobility that a lot of people don't have. We're finding that this year's graduates, undergraduates, have more jobs than people have had in years. Now, so I, don't, I, I really don't think that's going to be One of the issues is, of course, the aging of the, of the workforce. One of the interesting things about the United States is the failure of the white community to reproduce itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the last... 10 years, there's been a net reduction of, of white people. They're older, they don't have children. And of course, there's older, they have fewer children. Uh, we have a lot more, the, the growth has come Hispanic, mainly in terms of bulk. Yes. Uh, and their lack of mobility is still greater, uh, that will become more and more successful. To me, it is, it is mobility and education, mobility and skills more than anything else. And the, that we'll look back at the resignation. As an anecdote. A, a certain older white workers okay but uh, also does it what you're saying does it mean that companies as a whole should start getting a lot more involved in skill building in developing these skills and uh either digital or otherwise we uh, I, we see a lot of premium for soft skills as well people who know how to negotiate how to communicate or or, or even thinking strategically which was the subject of a past pro- podcast um, do you see companies getting more involved in the training of their workforce this is the problem again, goes back to the 80s, to the financialization of, of business, where people decided we'll hire new people when we need them, or fire old people when, when, when we don't need them. And that's fine, mm-hmm. because we're thinking now of, 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 of quarterly profits rather than long term. Mm-hmm. And I don't know the answer to that, because the, the emphasis on shorter term profits, on quarterly profits, uh, would rule out for many companies would seem to rule out investment in long-term development of, of, of personnel. Of, yes. I mean, this is the whole uh, GE, uh, what's his name, Welsh view. Mm-hmm. There's a new book about Welsh worth reading. Um, if you're only concerned about board, quarter, uh, quarterly returns, that's the primary thing in shareholder, then developing the, the, the same way companies did when I was a kid, I, you know, where you were there for life and, and training was a part of this, I don't know. I, I don't see that. I don't know. I don't know enough. The new mm-hmm. technology, we don't have I, data, but it seems to me that the answer should be yes. But can you convince the, the, the financial types that this is a worthwhile investment? Now, if you can't get people and you can't keep them, that may be the best answer. Mm-hmm. But yeah. it's not It's not the obvious answer as it was in the 50s, 60s, in, in, into, the, you know, into, the, into the 70s. Uh, that's... Uh, so that battle will have to be fought again. I mean, one of the things that, that again, in my lifetime, <clears throat> I went to a high school, as I said, kids and people didn't go to college, but we had commercial uh, courses. We had wood shop, body shop, metal shop. I mean, the students did not come out. They might have been not highly educated, but they were skilled. They were skilled. Then it became college, college prep. And many of the students who in the old world were still there. Mm-hmm. And they got sort of off to college for no, you know, you know. And when I taught at Pitt in those years, we had to create a special program to get these people up to a point where they could actually do anything in college. Didn't make any sense. We didn't. We dropped the whole idea of technical schools. Uh, 
I mean, they became the same as boar stools. If you went to a technical yes. school, oh my God, that were. Mm. And so even the, the community colleges, which were created to fill the gap, once, you mm. know, once the new president then gets his breath of air, he wants to make it a four-year liberal arts college. And, and, and so if you look at the, the infrastructure we've created, unlike Germany, for example, mm. of, of, of apprenticeship, Yes, of, of uh, technical training, it's it's very thin, and it's hard to get into many of these programs. Yes, so I mean, I often thought if we could have kept the technical skills at our, uni- our schools and advanced with technology, rather than letting the unions control this, mm-hmm. we might have had a better outcome. But you know, everyone is a Monday morning quarterback. I have a, a, a few more questions for you, especially talking about trade unions with, with very little trade unions in the United States. Where do you see wages going in the next semesters or in the next few years? Will market forces oh. be able to bring back some of the workers uh, to, to, to difficult jobs or jobs that have difficult working conditions? Or does okay. that have to go through some form of uni- unionization? We've seen it in, in some Amazon warehouses. Okay. Again, get the bigger picture here. We are not a low unionization economy. We have very high levels of unionization, pink collar, white collar. Every, every school teacher, every, almost every university professor, every government employee, these are all heavily unionized. Every police force is unionized. Mm-hmm. Where we have lost union members is in industrial unions. Okay. One of the reasons being that manual la- industrial labor has shrunken so much. Mm-hmm. But if you look for unionization, uh, we have a lot of unions. As I say, every policeman, every blue collar, every, every, uh, every school teacher, every government employee, huge uh, unions. Uh, whether this fits in the same model that you and I integrated mm-hmm. learning about unions, mm-hmm. whether these were forces potentially for aggressive change, You know, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, part of the problem, we're, what you're saying is, we don't have the industrial unions as shrunk because we just we have many fewer people working in in, in this industry. area. And those people, if you go to an automobile plant today, you see very few, few people hammering anything or carrying anything. They're Most programming the computers and robots. And, and yes, and and that's likely to become more so. Mm-hmm. The, for me, one of the big questions is how you manage. This new kind of you know, truckers are, are very powerful. Union. Mm-hmm. Like the thing you and I had thought of when we talked about industrial unions and fighting True. for wages and so on. True. So, again, we're learning a great deal, but a lot of the structure of all this is changing. So, we don't think, I don't think we're looking at as a low union society, it's a, a different union mm-hmm. uh, society. And I'm not sure. For those of us like you or me who are more on the progressive side, mm-hmm. how we conceptualize yes. th- some of these new unions, so, I, I, I'm not sure. It might be difficult for these diff- th- those jobs with hard working conditions, even if they start paying higher or better wages, to overcome the, f- the difficulties related to other cost of living or, or mobility difficulties we see. Uh, another question, the U.S. economy is still an innovation powerhouse. How do you explain this? Given all the ch- social challenges we've spoke we've sp- spoken about, the, the 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 political cleavage cleavage we see in, in the United States, how come the U.S. economy keeps innovating at such speed? Well, some of us are worried about there's not enough innovation, but if, in general, we have a lot of bright people, really. And if you look at uh, so many of the leading, not billionaires, but moving up toward that, are are immigrants, mm-hmm. Asian immigrants, you know. India, it's really remarkable the extent to which um, people come and do what they always have done in this country. They put together a couple bucks. And remember, there's a lot of money floating around. This mm-hmm. is not the depression. Mm-hmm. There's huge piles of It's not in institutions the way we think of it, because you know, this, this is an individual who's going to buy Twitter. I yes. mean, how, how can you? But and within that system, there's tons of money. Bright people, good schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't really count the failures of, of, the, of whom there are many. Mm-hmm. Again, it's it's it, what is remarkable is that given the difficulties, legal and regulatory, and so on, especially between communities, states, and all, that 
that innovation does succeed. One of the problems I think we have is that innovation in this country, but I think generally in the all over, does not necessarily move in directions that society needs most. Oh yes, I I, comp- I I agree. But but still, viewed from Europe or viewed from Canada, um, there's the U.S. still manages to produce champions in various aspects of technology. That it's it's still uh, it still is the envy of the rest of the world. I I won't speak for China or India or 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 Russia. We'll get to that later. It's not moving ahead. We're not going to be the leading innovators in electric cars. We're not going to be the leading innovators in semiconductors, probably. Uh, and, and, you know, if you're looking over the horizon, uh, we may say that in the next generation, we've lost that leadership in critical new areas. Mm-hmm. We've been so busy mining established things mm-hmm. where, you know, we're, we're, it's, we're not sure whether we're, we're going to be innovating in terms of cl- dealing with climate change. I don't know oh. anyone isn't. But we're, but we're not. The Europeans have probably done more uh, engineering. You know. um, so I, I'm not sure how this is going. Many of us are worried about that. There's just no way we're going to catch up on EVs. Mm. Uh, that, that, uh, and if we're looking at all the electronics that go into modern, modern products, mm-hmm. we are responsible. A lot of it we have developed the ideas for. Yes. But... If you're looking at semiconductors, what is it? Ninety percent come from South Korea, yeah. uh, and it's very hard to break into those markets. Now, admittedly, and you know this, we pick up a lot of money from the supply chains. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the, the um, iPhone we're talking about is assembled in uh, in China, and what do we provide? That are the big we we make most of the profits marketing advertising mm-hmm. design mm-hmm. but not build no and you know it's not possible as you look ahead that the united states strength will be in services which have very few jobs and if you look at iphone that's what we do we are the we we design it we market it we, we, we uh all that stuff but we don't have but it doesn't give us many jobs and the hard stuff is produced in, in south korea it's produced Very little is produced in China, but they put it all together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, that, and as we look ahead, that that strikes to many of us a, a real problem. We design, we we do a lot of the value uh, value engineering, or the we bring a lot of value to the product, but we don't actually bring a lot of workers or or um, or profits from the assembly where there's a lot of manpower involved and semiconductors is going to be something fascinating to follow in the next couple of years the story of this relationship between apple and tsmc where apple designs and and this korean company manufactures or and, and if you look deeper into this business the the machines that build these semiconductors on a large scale They're not always as traditionally they were Japan, Germany, the United States. China is, is, is developing a lot of that technology as well. Just one last question. Um, last time we spoke was in the fall of 2020, before the war Russia currently wages in Ukraine. Has this changed anything in the rivalry between China and the U.S., which you said much, much more about economics and business than about military? How has this Ukraine war thing changed the view the U.S. has on China? We don't know yet. I mean, we really don't. I mean, on one level, there's been a, a, a lia- closer liaison on the sort of surface level between China and uh, mm-hmm. and Russia. And yet, it doesn't look like China has really done much physically. They've taken more oil, but they've been rel- they, they still have not uh, applied weapons or anything like that. Mm-hmm. The, the, the fear that people have is that this will produce a China-Russia uh, axis. Certainly, I think the Russians would like that. But uh, we don't know what the Chinese have in mind. And the Chinese suffer badly because unlike any other situation, the Chinese depend on the global economy yes. more than any, any other country. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Chinese domestic production is still mar- not marginal, but less than the growth in, through through export through participating globally agree yeah. and they don't look at that so i i don't know how the chinese 
And I think it's a, sort of a day-to-day -day thing for the Chinese, looking at the Russians on one side, looking at Ukraine, being sort of scared, of, you know, or, or wow, and then also thinking about Taiwan. Mm -hmm. What is all that? How does that rethink that whole thing? And their determination to create a zone, a Chinese zone, in the east, in the, in the eastern Pacific, mm -hmm. uh, that they're still moving forward on. I mean, China is a big country, rich with a lot of different aims with the same thing going on, things going on at the same time. Yes, their military is still going on a lot. They are still very much involved in extending the Chinese reach. Yes, uh, into the, the Pacific. We'll see. Again, it's difficulty of forecasting. I could imagine if the Russian situation really deteriorates, that the Chinese move out quickly and become a lot friendlier. I could also imagine just as easily that the, that the Russian situation remains stabilized, that they, they say, well, this is our only, these are our, really our best friends and so on, we better. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Chinese have very little interest in Russia economically. Yes. They can stuff from Russia, oil and gas, but Russia is a tiny market. Russia is a less than the size of Italy. I mean, there really isn't much that, that they can do. So I think everyone is in suspenseful waiting. Uh, uh, see what happens next. And don't forget, we are in a shooting war mm -hmm. with a major nuclear power. And the United States is tissue. It, it's defense, not defense. It's outside of this by a tissue paper wall. Yes. Uh, yes. As, as we said, well, more and more heavy. I more call more it weapons. Viet. I call it Vietnam in reverse, with uh, uh, the Americans helping Ukraine the same way Chinese was uh, helping the NVA back in the fifties and sixties. But I'm not an expert there. I don't want to. Uh, um, I don't think we know anything yet. Mm -hmm. And as I said at the very beginning of our conversation, when likely scenarios, the first likely and the next most likely, are 180 degrees apart as they are with China, all you know that's the time to keep your head down. <laughs> uh, you, because you don't want to buy a stray bullet. I mean, I think it's quite possible. I think nuclear war is possible. It's on the yes. table. Yeah. Uh, there are people saying this is the third world war. I think an agreement with Putin, as Putin could get Putin pushed out, I, I it's possible. It's on the table. Mm. I would put much less. Certainly saying it's not possible. Uh, uh, what seems most likely is a long-term bitter, bitter uh, battle with Ukraine being gradually worn down by the Russians. But the Russians get worn down to it. Again, I, many people think the end of it will be some sort of agreement on, on the East. The real issue will be, will Ukraine have an access to the Black Sea? Mm -hmm. Will it keep Odessa? But who knows? A last remark, um, uh, Gwyn Dyer, the late Gwyn Dyer, which I, enjoy, I loved, uh, I thought he was uh, a great Canadian historian and writer, said that China should worry more about Russia and about these conflicts, he said, what happens, the big question is, what happens when conventional weapons run out or conventional weapons run out of ammunition? That's the real danger. He used, he saw, that's the way he saw things. Well, I think that's, I mean, what, what will Putin do if really pushed into a corner? Mm. I, I don't know. Um, you have to realize that Russia, except for its nuclear weapons, is a poor country yes. economically, mm -hmm. aging. Mm -hmm. um, just coming up with soldiers and so on is good. But I, I don't know. One It, last question. Many economists got a few things wrong regarding the current trends in inflation. And I, I keep reading Paul Krugman in the New York Times every week religiously, trying to get his feel on this. But how is inflation really, uh, quote unquote, really Inf affecting the U.S. economy so far, we saw robust job growth just this past week. What's all? Wh where? Where do you see it? You've been through the big stagflation of the late seventies, early eighties. Where do you see that? Uh, in inflation has not affected the economy as it much as it has affected the morale. Uh -huh. There are very few people. Again, remember, I said that. One of the results of the, these economic changes, this one, will be to make uh, some people better off. People can manage, will will be okay, and other people will make a great deal of money from this. Mm -hmm. There'll be others who hammer down even further. That's a reality. But but given that, my sense is that the the, the, the inflation thus far has been affected affects morale the morale mm -hmm. than 
economics. Now, some people are getting hammered. There's no doubt about that. True. And, and the other, and a lot of some people are making a lot of money from this. However, it also, as you said, affect, could affect voting. Yes. Because it, 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 people do feel, you know, the gas price. I, I don't think, again, some people are hammered by this. There's no doubt. But by and large, thus far, the price rise, I think, has been less a problem economically than it has been in terms of morale, of perception, of, of, of view of politics and so on thus far. And I think that the this is not the 1970s. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is not certainly not the 1930s. Uh, this is a this is an economy rapidly changing, rapidly moving ahead. If anything, I think this is causing companies where they have money, and a lot of them do, to substitute machines for people to think you know to to to, to make fundamental changes. Uh, interest rates are still very low for borrowing. Yes, I mean if you're going to do something, this is not a bad moment. It's still uh, a good time to invest. Yes, I think so. Um, um, this is not regulate pour mieux sauté. <laughs> of course. I don't we have that. There's no need to regulate at this stage. I mm-hmm. think many companies are going to move ahead. Whether they will move ahead in directions that are that you and I would think are socially desirable, whether they will move ahead in ways that uh, help resolve fundamental social issues in this country. Or, or climate issues, yes. Remains to be seen. But there's coin to be made mm-hmm. in, at the moment, and there is investment capital around, and uh, we'll see. Au revoir. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much, Professor Blank. It's, uh, as usual, a great pleasure to have you and to listen to your deep thoughts on, on these, uh, these fundamental and, and complex questions. That's why I love doing this. It is, as you can tell, you have to tie me. I've been tied to my chair. I wouldn't even do it if I weren't tied down. Uh, I, of course, enjoy it very much. You Thank take you. it easy. And, and we'll, uh, we'll try and see you in, in New York this fall. I will see you in Paris. That would be fantastic. I'm just going to hang out and become the ideal flanner. <laughs> and I will take you through the town for a full day. I look forward to that very, very much. You be well. Thank you for letting me participate in this. Take care. Oh, well, we'll have you in, at least. We'll have you soon. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Je remercie le professeur Blank pour sa générosité et son point de vue personnel et érudit sur ces questions. Compétences, éducation, mobilité sont les grands enjeux de l'économie du futur, sans oublier comment nous allons pouvoir réduire les inégalités qui minent nos sociétés. Vaste sujet et je vais tâcher de trouver un autre interlocuteur pour nous aider à y voir plus clair dans ces questions. Je vous invite à visiter notre site Internet pour télécharger l'épisode et pour lire les notes au www.inteliaconsulting.com baroblique épisode 65. Nous vous invitons aussi à nous suivre sur votre plateforme de balado-diffusion préférée. Et finalement, je vous invite à vous abonner à notre podcast sur notre site Internet afin de rester au fait de nos communications et mises à jour. Merci beaucoup et à très bientôt.